There are many question marks surrounding the Vancouver real estate market. When will interest rates peak? Are real estate prices coming down? And where will all these new immigrants live? To help us navigate these unique times and shed some light on the Vancouver real estate market, we have Dan Wortel and Ryan Dash. Dan and Ryan are both award-winning real estate agents at EXP Realty, and together they lead the Vancouver Life team, a group of agents specialized in buying, selling, and investing. Thanks for being here with us today, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, yeah. So let's dive right into it. Um, what does the Vancouver real estate market look like today with interest rates at the levels they currently are? It's a not an easy question to answer. And, and if I'm going to be completely honest with you, Vancouver is doing uh, doing things that are completely different to the rest of the country. Um, for example, I mean, we look at uh, affordability right now is probably the biggest aspect of interest rate influence in the market, right? It's not like home prices, as much as buyers would love to see, um, home prices have come down between 9 and 10% on average, right? Yeah, sure, they've come down a little bit more as you scale up in price, but that's because the buyer pool is smaller and it's more susceptible to higher fluctuations in price point. As you come down in price point, that buyer pool tends to flatten out. And so does the movement in price, right? And largely with interest rates coming up, everyone was expecting to see a bit more panic selling, a few more listings coming onto the marketplace, but we haven't really seen that. Interest rates right now are really doing nothing more than piling up buyers on the sidelines who are going to be waiting to pounce once we get any kind of semblance that interest rates are stabilizing. I, I think we're kind of heading towards that path. If you look at the 100 basis point hike, 75 basis point hike, the 50 basis point hike, we are trending towards stabilization. Now, Dan and I kind of differ in terms of how we think they'll get to that rate. Um, I, I tend to think they'll overshoot and then cut rates back to where they want to go. Um, and, and Dan can elaborate a little bit more on, on his position. And it largely, there's so many variables that it could really go either way. But generally speaking, interest rates have made property incredibly unaffordable. And that's that's the issue. The issue isn't demand. The issue has always been supply. But now when you restrict the flow of credit, you simply handcuff people who need to buy a bigger house and now no longer have the funds to do it. Vancouver is also a very wealthy city. So, you know, when house prices drop even just 10, 15 percent, you enter a new buyer pool. And when that happens, those prices tend to slow down in terms of their movement. So interest rates have made things very expensive, um, but they haven't really done much to, to quash demand or anything to that effect. They've maybe, they've maybe put buyers on the sideline and it's temporary, but the long-term projection here for, for Vancouver real estate, I am extremely bullish on. Yeah, and you touched on it uh, early on there, and I think a lot of those factors kind of contribute to this question. But you know, what are you seeing in the difference between pricing between sellers and buyers' expectations right now? Yeah, it's pretty exceptional, if you will, because of course, what's happening is buyers are thinking that it's you know fallen off a cliff when it comes to prices, and they're expecting these deep, deep discounts, <laughs> whereas the sellers are still kind of wanting those glamorous numbers that we saw back at the peak of the market back in like February and March. And because it's it's shifted so incredibly fast, people are still in essence in a state of shock, meaning that they're kind of dug their heels in and be like, oh, whoa, whoa, we weren't, you know, it's it's it wasn't that long ago where things were really expensive or I could sell for over ask, et cetera. And then again, you've got these buyers that are now asking for deep discounts. And realistically, these are the same buyers that six short months ago were lining up to outbid the next guy by a hundred grand. So the sentiment has changed incredibly quickly. And of course, like we kind of touched on here, it's resulting in, you know, two decade low in sales month after month after month. So it's essentially a standoff. Sellers and buyers are not seeing eye to eye right now. And uh, because it's moved so quick, these sellers don't have to sell for the most part. And buyers, ultimately, they don't have much in inventory to choose from. So it's just like a freeze out there right now with both sides having largely unrealistic expectations. Great, great points there. And it kind of segue, segues into the next question here is, you know, if I'm a buyer right now, and I believe that there is an opportunity to purchase a price, whatever that discount may be, 
Uh, if I want to go out shopping right now, what do the inventory levels look like for, for me as a, as a buyer right now? Um, are we seeing an uptick in listings? Are we seeing people just not put their property on the market? Uh, what are you guys seeing right now? Okay, this is a... <clears throat> It's not just a straightforward answer again. <laughs> okay, so you got to if we got we go back two years, okay. Um, people who were buying and selling, and people who were not buying and selling, both susceptible to interest rates, right? When interest rates went from their current place down to zero point two five percent, you know, and you could get a mortgage for one point three. Whether you were in a fixed mortgage at that time or whether you were house hunting for a home, chances are you refinanced your home to take advantage of those incredibly low rates. So if somebody who had a plan to sell their house in two years now just refinanced and got their mortgage down at 1.7, 1.6%, yeah, it's changed a little bit where it is now. Maybe it's fixed and it hasn't changed. They're going to go and sell their home. And then they're going to go and have to qualify at 7%, right? You got a stress test 2% beyond the qualifying rate right, right now. So people cannot get the same money that they could for the inventory that they need. And so, you know, any natural home seller is going to go, well, I'm not selling right now. I can't get this house again. So why would I sell? So you're seeing, you know, resale inventory is, is freezing up like crazy and they're going to weather the storm. So that's why we haven't seen a ton of panic selling, why we haven't seen a huge influx of inventory like we have in other parts of Canada. Also, we're, we're, we're incredibly restricted with our geography, right? So you can't go west, you can't go north, you can't go south. So people have to go up. And that, you know, there, there's only so many of those when it takes four to six years to build a tower in Vancouver. So if I actually just, talk a little bit about the the real inventory numbers right now. So new listings, for example, last month, we just crossed over 4,000. I think it was 4,038 new listings last month. Okay. We go back to the height of the market in February, March, 2022. We were looking at 6,700. Okay. Much better time to sell your house. Everybody had money and yet, and inventory levels were not double, but getting up there. Right. And so now it's become far more expensive to buy a house. The conditions would be, I don't know, more ripe for people to unload. And yet inventory levels are maybe up 10% from, you know, where, where they were even just a year ago. And so our total inventory this year peaked at around 11,000 units. Okay. And right now we're sitting just shy of 9,900. So we have not seen a massive influx of inventory. And that's due in part to the rates that we talked about. It's also due in part to immigration. Immigration is a huge piece of the inventory issue. 500,000 people a year is what we're projected for 2025. And I can tell you right now, we are already blowing by those numbers. Yeah, and you talked about uh, a bit of our constraint geography wise, um, a lot of buildings going up, you know, when when prices and uh, everything was looking to, to trend upwards, there was a lot of pre-sale condos coming to market. Um, do you expect to see a lot of assignments coming up as well as incentives for, for developers to be hitting their targets? <laughs> yeah, yeah. pre-sale world always interesting and definitely for investors. And let's keep in mind, just like the resale market last year hit an all time high for pre-sale sales. And understandably, those are the quickest to fall as well. So we're seeing numbers here in Vancouver, for example, we're somewhat or we're somewhere around the 72% decrease in sales volumes compared to that all time high from this quarter last year. Toronto, it's even more exasperated. I, I think if they're like 86% down from this time last year. Uh, but keep in mind, they're still moving, right? We've had about 1500 units sell last quarter here in GVRD. Um, so the numbers are lower, but they're still moving. The thing is, like you touched on, it's because it's changing so fast. If let's say you bought a pre-sale unit 24 months ago and it's about to close in the next uh, month to six months kind of thing. If you did not pre-qualify and lock in a rate like you can do with these banks now that do allow for three to four year rate holds, you may get a bit of a sticker shock when they tell you what you can actually qualify for today. And that will, of course, result if you can't afford to close on it, a increase in assignments. 
And I'll share a quick story from 2019 because it, we may see a similar market happen up uh, or coming up here where if we all remember, you know, 16, 17 was the high, 18, 19, things dropped off and similar to what happened or what might happen now, people had to offload units that they could not complete on. And so I had a, a client who picked up an assignment. Somebody had bought two thinking it was a great idea to you know make twice as much money, but ultimately these were $1.2 million condos. And the poor buyer at that time couldn't close on either one, had to offload them both. And these had about a quarter million dollar deposits. And so it was a lesser evil for that person to offload them at a hundred thousand dollar price reduction than to try and close on it. Can't find that money, lose the deposit, go through litigation, potentially whatever. So to answer that question long windedly, yeah, I think we're going to get into a market here where there's going to be a bunch of assignments at deep discounts. They're already starting to poke out at slight discounts, but again, this, uh, in this landscape, good chance those are going to become even more readily available. And guys, just to, to, and that, I mean, you got to think about it. If you're carrying inventory and you've borrowed money to carry inventory, you're not able to service the debt anymore. You're going to offload your price. That's what's going to happen. You're going to make you sure that you can actually sell your property so that you're not ending up in that position. And that's where we're likely going to see a lot of the price movement. It's not going to come out of the resale side because people are locked up. It's going to come out of new home buyers carrying inventory on variable rates. They cannot keep that level of debt. They cannot service that level of debt. So where you're going to see a lot of price movement is likely going to be in new home builds. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, but uh, you know, Canada has some some very lofty immigration uh, numbers here over the next several years. Um, what what impact does this have on two levels? First, being the the rental market here, uh, and then second, you know, once they're out of the rental market inside of the the uh, the residential space, their condos, single family, townhomes. Well, um, I mean, the first thing to get hit with uh, when you have high levels of immigration are rental numbers, right? Nobody knows where to live, so they don't want to commit to something too long, and they also don't want to put a bunch of money down in in a space they don't understand. So. Is there any surprise that we're seeing all-time high rental rates right now? It doesn't surprise me with a lack of inventory that rental rates are as high as they are, right? People might not be able to also just even find the place despite wanting to buy it. It might not be there for them or they thought they could afford it and they can't. There's a lot of reasons why it's pushed up. But if we actually speak to um, new permanent residents, for example, Canada had a target this year, 430,000, right? We're 485,000 to date. Okay. Wow. And then you add in temporary students, foreign students, that's another 200,000 people. So this year alone, we're just shy of 700,000. It sounded like 500,000 was going to be a lot. But when reality is the, the government just blows by these margins, which actually just they understand that the way out of their current debt scenario is by taxable revenue. So the more people they bring in, the more income tax that they can make, the more property transfer tax that they can make, the faster they can pay back the debts that they've incurred. So it doesn't really surprise me. Furthermore, I think we're also dealing with a, a, an aging population that is going into retirement. And we also, the economy needs people. So like it or not, um, and, and that's honestly why I think, you know, getting in to the real estate market now, even with even just a 10% discount in, in, in Vancouver could play a fairly large, um, be a fairly large move, generally speaking, because on the other side of this, I'm telling you, we've seen this market before. And Vancouver recently elected a new mayor, Ken Sim, um, talking about affordability, immigration. You know, do you think this is going to be a good thing for the real estate sector? In theory. <laughs> I mean, on paper, <laughs> it really yeah. is. And of course, I, I truly believe Ken won because uh, uh, he campaigned so strongly on a housing platform, you know, reminiscent to David Eby here as well. I mean, yeah, the intention is great, but that's intention. Action and results are obviously something quite different. Uh, the thing I like, I think the most about Ken Sim and his platform was that he at least has the mentality. He realizes the issue is on the supply side. He's not out here saying he's going to tax the demand, which we've proven does not work for the last 40 years here. So that's at least a good start. Now, his number one campaign, I think the one that 
likely put him over the top. And the one that was the most interesting was his three by three by three by one uh, plan, which essentially is just fast tracking, getting your building permits. Mm -hmm. um, sounds good. But again, I just pulled this up today for clarification. And there was a story that came out in the Vancouver Sun in uh, March of 2017. So five and five and a half years ago. And the headline was Vancouver to test ways to speed up approval of development permits. <laughs> and then because in 2014, getting a permit to build a house was eight and a half weeks. By 2016, that was 28 weeks. Okay, so this, this problem has been wide known and widespread for, for a decade more even really. So again, I hope he has the wherewithal and the abilities and the resources and the backing to make it happen. Um, again, it's great on paper, but will it get there? I don't know. Um, we all hope it does. We know it's the problem. But again, he's up against a, a tidal wave of, of pushback here. Um, the, real the quick, board. I guess, to touch on a few other ones. I mean, incentivize uh, purpose-built rentals. Awesome, for sure, of course, right? We obviously need more rentals. If they exist, it pulls back on the rental rates that are obviously all-time highs right now, which will help the housing community. And also, excuse me, it'll also help developers be incentivized to, to build to that type of housing. Because as a developer, they're not doing this for their health. They're going out to make money. And <laughs> if they are incentivized to build rental housing, they will. They're going to go where the profit goes. And, and yes, I understand they will have you know allocations that they must do for rental housing. But again, they can take an entire rental tower and say, actually, no, there's more money for us in selling this right now to end users. So we're going to do that. Um, so those two things, again, it, it all on paper sounds good. Uh, social housing, cleaning up the Lower East Side. Obviously, we know that's the worst it's ever been. I've personally lived in Vancouver for 26 years, and cleaning up the Lower East Side was a, a headline and hot topic then. It's worse mm. today than it's ever been. These are all great agendas. They're very complicated. There's no easy answer. I wish him well. Uh, I'm pro <laughs> Ken Sim. And I think maybe here too, with David Eby in power, there might be some good alignment, and we may actually see some stuff happen. So good luck to them both. As it's well known, though, the road to hell was paved with good intentions. <laughs> funny, funny stat there. Hey, eight, 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 eight weeks to twenty-eight weeks really looks like they're uh, they're expediting the uh, the approval process there. Yeah, they've been adding employees. Apparently, they've been researching and analyzing this for 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 decades, and no one's found an answer. So, again, I don't know what's happening behind the scene, but I still believe it's being done by on purpose. Let's just say. I mean, maybe another uh, another profession after the uh, the real estate chapter is done in your life. Huh. You, not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that job. <laughs> not much glory there. Um, talking to different uh, asset classes, um, condos, single family homes, townhomes. Kind of talk about what you're seeing in terms of activity levels within those three areas there. Uh, well, the, the sales to active ratio is probably a great way to discern this information. Uh, it's something that comes out every month um, and it breaks it down into single family homes, uh, condos and townhouses. And without a doubt, you know, back up again, two years, um, single family homes were the thing to explode. I mean, the pandemic came out and said everybody uh, needed to stay away from condos and any kind of common living space. And you needed an extra bedroom for your your stay at home office and your stay at home gym. And so single family homes, the utility for a single family home went through the roof. That utility is changing a little bit now, right? And um, we've seen, so for single family homes and the sales to active ratio, we're sitting at 14%, which is kind of right in the middle of a, of a balanced market, right? Where our sellers and, and buyers have to work together in order to put a deal together. But when you go to townhomes at 23.7% and condos leading the way at 24%, those two are nearly tied and they still exist in a seller's market. So what we're seeing the most of in terms of activity is still condos because there's just far more inventory when it comes to condos and also the price point, again, is far lower. So generally speaking, more transactions take place. So that's where most of the activity is taking place, but that's not where the deals are. The deals are in single family. Like, honestly speaking, you know, one thing to, to consider here in the, in the Fraser Valley at the height of the market, you know, your average price for a home was one seven, 1 1.8. You can buy that very same home today for one, two, one, three in the Fraser Valley. That's, that's a deal. 
what people don't like is they've got to pay the interest rate for it. But whatever happening to, you know, taking out a one-year mortgage and, or a two-year mortgage or refinancing that property, you know, when, when conditions improve, that, that to me seems to be the baffling part of this. But generally speaking, I think, you know, when it comes to condos, uh, we haven't seen a whole ton of price fluctuation, both up or down. And that's due in part to um, their accessibility and the amount of them and the buyer pools. But yeah, your deals are happening in the single family area. Uh, I don't think townhomes are going to really move too much because families have always struggled to stay in the city uh, and townhomes are really the only option they have. So whether they like it or not, they can't afford a single family home, even with today's numbers. Um, so they're still striving for the townhouse and they still want to be within, you know, 10, 20 minutes of the downtown core where, where they work. And I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that the the deals and maybe the good investment opportunities uh, are in the uh, you know single detached. Just need a bit longer of a, a mindset and maybe a good uh, piece of advice from a, a realtor like you guys. So, um, Dan, you mentioned you've been here for twenty six years in Vancouver, and Ryan, I believe you're born and raised. Um, tell us about how you did get into this real estate space um, and a bit about the Vancouver Life Real Estate Group. Uh -huh, appreciate it. Um, all right, so super long. Long answer shortened, uh, I got into real estate because my mortgage broker at the time um, gave me a refinance on my property and gave me a line of credit. And I had finally had some money to invest. And I essentially talked to all my wealthy and successful friends about where are they investing and where's the best place to put some, some capital. And it all came back to real estate. So learned all about real estate investing, joined Rain, met Taylor, and through that platform, started investing and buying properties for myself ultimately doing it as a hobby, but enjoyed it so much that I decided to make it a full-time career. Um, me and Ryan joined or started, got our license right around the same time and just quickly created a, a friendship. And that turned into a partnership here that we've built a, a company, a real estate company. And now we're, we're seven agents plus the virtual assistant because we wanted to be able to service a larger area. So Ryan and I are largely Vancouver East and West, but now we've got agents that represent our clients in places like Burnaby and Richmond. And we've even added on an agent in Whistler to cover that area. So that's kind of a good insight into how I got into real estate and, and what our team looks like. And I'm sure Ryan can elaborate more with his story. Yeah, I, I got into real estate on the construction side. Uh, I came out of a university with a degree in nothing uh, <laughs> useful anyhow. <laughs> Uh, at least it didn't present itself at the time. Uh, so I was bartending uh, then I was traveling the world. And then when I came back, uh, I, I was bartending for a guy who was like, Hey, you're too smart to be behind the bar. You should come work for me. And so I learned about, uh, learned about the construction world and spent, uh, nearly a decade in the construction world as a senior construction project manager and a senior development, uh, project manager. So my job for years was to fly into places I hadn't, I didn't know, uh, all over Western Canada, do feasibility studies and figure out whether or not this is a great place to invest, look at metrics and, uh, make a, make a case to deploy millions of dollars or not. Um, and after a while I realized I was making other people way too much money. Um, and I was working myself to death. And so, uh, I decided to go out on my own. I had had a, a young child at the time and met Dan and was like, this is way better. Let's do this. <laughs> and here we are. It's a cool, uh, cool story. Yeah. I remember Dan meeting you through the rain group probably seven or eight years ago now. And then uh, when you had just jumped into the business as a realtor uh, on your own, and then when you partnered up with, with Ryan and now it seems like you guys uh, mutate and form a new team member every single uh, week. So it's been cool to see <laughs> the, uh, the growth of the, uh, the Vancouver life team. So Congratulations on uh, on all of that. Um, Thanks, I know you guys do a lot of work with with real estate investors. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys get this question: where where should I be investing? So, if you're meeting with a new client right now and they're looking for you know a buy and hold piece of real estate to invest in, uh, what what's an area that you're you're pointing them towards? For sure, and obviously a, a bit of a loaded question because every investor has unique asset, uh, you know, classes that they're interested in capital to work with. But I'll I'll give you a, a broad answer here, and actually I'll give you two, because um, I think let's say um, a client's working with around a quarter million in capital, and they're and they're looking to invest definitely in real estate and definitely within Canada. 
Right now, and again, based a little bit on um, what we're seeing fundamental wise in Alberta, Calgary is looking really strong for let's call at least the next five to seven years. So with a quarter million bucks, you could go in there and you could buy a, an existing fourplex, let's say, do a bit of a renovation and get uh, market rents. So that's one option, or even you know find a duplex, suite it, again, get those four sources of, of revenue going. If you're thinking, hey, I really wanna do something closer to home, I'm quite bullish on the Langley area still. You know, a lot of, now that the SkyTrain's been announced, yes, there's already been quite a lift because people know where the terminals are going to be, but you know, they still have to put the shovels in the ground here. So there's gonna be a nice lift in the Langley area along the SkyTrain um, stops, of course. I would pick up, try to pick up a detached or townhouse along one of those within a, a kilometer of one of the stops would be my advice today. Pretty good advice. Um, I mean, generally speaking, guys, um, I have two twofold answer as well. Mine's asset class dependent. Uh, I generally think if you get into a single family home right now, if you can somehow squeeze your way into it, beg, borrow, steal, whatever you got to get in. When you consider where uh, immigration is going in the, in the next, call it decade, having a piece of dirt to call your own uh, is not going out of style. And if that means you got to pay an extra 10 or 15 grand this year in borrowing capacity, you know, and higher month monthlies to get that piece of property, uh, you're going to get it at a, at a fairly significant discount. I mean, like we talked about the Fraser Valley here, you're looking at, you know, three to $500,000 off what it was at the height. That's no joke. That's life-changing money. So get in, get a one-year fixed mortgage maybe two year fixed, see your way through this storm. Yeah, it's a little bit more money than you'd like to spend per month, but then refinance that property one and a half, two years later, and you're sitting pretty. The other thing that I'll mention too, and, and we also deal a lot with multifamily and industrial and commercial properties, um, buy anything industrial, anything. The, the, the industrial market is the gold rush out here. If you can get yourself a, a piece of industrial property or you can get invested with someone who owns it uh, or invested in a project that develops um, you know, industrial land, my goodness. I, I mean, we're working with guys right now that you know, are looking anywhere from one to 50 acres and you just can't find it. And we'll uh, leave you with one last question and it might be another loaded one. We seem to send you a few here today, but uh, <laughs> for someone looking to navigate or assess today's market, what's one piece of advice you'd give them? Gotcha. Well, let's quickly go through each sort of buyer or seller or investor, you know, personality here. And I think as a buyer, uh, well, for all of them, of course, definitely work with a professional. Don't try to do this yourself. Don't think that you have. Uh-oh, we lose Dan. Might have lost it that way. They look at oh. that one, that one next purchase, as opposed to working with someone who can actually guide them through stepping stones into the next um, house and maybe the dream home after that. As a seller, obviously a very unique time. Um, but if you're considering a move up, brilliant, brilliant landscape for you right now. One of the few types of of um, as, of buyers right now that can actually you know benefit from this. Um, sorry for sellers, sellers. Definitely case by case. You know what I mean? If you've held for two years, you're in a very different position than if you've held for 15 or 20. So again, talk to your professional. And investors, yeah, this is starting to feel a little bit like 2008, 2009, the global financial crisis, where there were immense opportunities on the other side of that. Stack your cash now and get ready for a whole bunch of opportunities that are going to show their head in the next 12-ish months. Yeah, I don't really have anything else to add to that other than... Honestly speaking, working with a professional right now is probably the best piece of advice. Anytime markets fluctuate, that's where money is made or lost, right? When when the market's running like it did in the last two years, everybody makes money, okay? There's not a lot of skill set required there. Maybe a skill set in terms of how much not to overpay. But right now, do I buy? Do I sell? Do I maneuver? Do I go into cash? What do I do with my position? This is where a professional who understands historical data, the implications of, of immigration, interest rates, maybe where they're going, having an understanding of inflation and what that means, and how all of those things tie into real estate. Uh, if you don't have a good grasp of those things, you're going to get you're going to stand up, you step on a landmine, 
And uh, there's lots of them out there right now too. That was a great way to, uh, to wrap it up, guys. Uh, Dan, I really liked the way that you broke that down into the, the three categories. And uh, we missed that middle part there on the, uh, the buyers. So we're going to have to charge uh, $9.99 for the listeners to get <laughs> that, that little part they missed out on. Um, I think it just shows, you know, in turbulent times like today, it's important to work with professionals that are in the market every single day that are understanding what's going on from a buying side, a selling side, the interest rate perspective. So just really shows how important it is to have true professionals on your side. And uh, we're grateful to have you guys, both Dan and Ryan today on, uh, on the show. So thanks for being here. You're so Thanks welcome. for having us. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.